Alright guys, Stockaholics, thank you guys for being here today. I'm going to be talking about Tesla. <laughs> so, uh, before I start, I'd like to mention that I am neither long nor short, and that I am making this video for the Tesla Bulls. Uh, <laughs> I would like you guys to be aware of uh, some of the things that I have seen in this stock. Now, I would like to say I find Tesla to be one of the most horrifying and yet fascinating stocks of all time. Uh, I've been following this for about the last year since it started uh, mooning, which I'm sure that many others have, have done uh, similarly. Um, but I think that if you are in this stock, there are things that you should definitely be aware of. But before we talk about Tesla, I would like to talk about Cisco. This is another technology company, since I know so many Tesla bulls insist that Tesla is also a technology company. So we'll compare it to a uh, technology company also, okay? Now, I drew a very rudimentary trend line from about 1993 all the way to 2020. This, we'll say, is the mean to the stock. Now, is this a perfect mean? No, it's not. Very rudimentary. I don't claim to be an expert on technicals or anything like that, okay? But I like there's an inference that we can draw from it, right? You notice that if we follow the growth for those 30 years, it tends to follow this line, right? But you'll notice an anomaly <laughs> on this in this stock. And that occurs approximately in the year 2000 and the year leading up to it, about maybe two years leading up to it. And you'll notice that there is a massive, 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 massive spike in the price per share for the company. During this time, there were an immense amount of people that were massively, massively bullish on this fantastic technology company. And, you know, they were right. It's a great company. I agree with them. But uh, the price that they were paying for this stock, well, a little bit, um, how you say, absurd. <laughs> but as all bubbles do, the party came to an end. So the year 2001 came, and something interesting that I'd like you guys to notice is that it fell below the mean. This is a pattern that if you are an extremely bullish a company, uh, you should, I think, consider uh, taking note of. But uh, over the 20 years, the stock after that bubble pop, great company kept growing, right? But if you had bought during the mania in the year 1998, 99, 2000, you would have to wait 20 years to not even make your money back on this investment. Okay, now let's look at another fantastic and awesome technology company, uh, Tesla. Uh, we'll say I drew a trend line down here and maybe we'll say that it was approximately, I don't know, slightly above $40 uh, where my mouse is here and to another, I don't know, slightly above $80 here. Now this isn't including any of the stock splits and the prices before that. Uh, I'm just excluding all of those things, right? And I'm also being a little bit generous here because where my head is, there is a line that is approximately flat. So be prior to 2013, this stock was quite flat. So if I was going to include that, it would actually, the trend line would probably be a little bit lower. But I won't. I'm going to be a little bit generous here today. But <laughs> I'd like you to notice how far above this stock price is <laughs> above this trend line. And I'd also like you to think about the conditions leading <laughs> into this price rally. Um, and ask yourself a question. Do you think that the stock, the growth in this company is justified in a global pandemic and likely global recession? Do you think that, and I know it's a technology company, okay, do you think that they're gonna be selling more automobiles in a global recess recession in the coming years? You know, the, the auto industry is a cyclical one. I'm big on cyclicals, right? 
There, but there are points in those cycles that are high, and there's points that are low. So I like I like to ask, you know, or if it's a technology company, you know, hey, maybe they're selling solar panels. Okay, uh, do you think that the increase in sales in the solar panel segment of the company justifies this kind of growth? Or do you think the data collection, the aspect of the company justifies this kind of growth? Um, I think if you're gonna be honest, you'll say no, uh, it doesn't. And if you're gonna be <laughs> analytical about it, you're gonna notice with uh, any kinds of analysis that this, this makes no sense. This company has is parabolic. And again, I think Tesla is a fantastic company. I'm not knocking it. I, I would buy Tesla. I would if the price were lower. Now, there's another way to think about it that um, kind of kind of shows you how insane this really is. First of all, I got this from a YouTuber. His name is David Modell. I'll put his link to his channel uh, in the in the description below. Highly recommend you check it out. He has some amazing videos and he also does a lot of technical analysis. But I'd like to talk a little bit about this. Uh, this black line here is Tesla. And what this is showing us is the market capitalization of the, I don't know, the top six uh, motor vehicle stocks, uh, vehicle stocks, right? The, and I'd like to, first of all, look at this pink line right here. And the market cap of Honda, which is that pink line, is $54 billion uh, for their whole stock. Now, this, gra this graph, this was uh, taken on Friday. Today, the market cap of Tesla increased by $40 billion almost the entire Mac market capitalization of the company of Honda, the whole stock price, it almost increased by the whole amount in one day of Honda. It went from $568 billion to $608 billion, $40 billion increase in one day. That is insane. That is, <laughs> and if I was a shareholder for Tesla, it would be horrifying. To put it in one way, if somebody, well, okay, if somebody held the gun to my head, I, I would hold Tesla. <laughs> but let's say it like this. If somebody offered me, I don't know, let's say the half the share price of Tesla. They said, you know what, Stockholics, for every share of Tesla you buy, I will give you $325, whatever it is today. I think it's $650 today. I'll give you half if you hold that sh those shares for five years. Um, you know, I would say no thanks. <laughs> that, if somebody could give me half of the money to hold this for five years, I wouldn't do it. That is how much risk, that is how horrifying <laughs> I think this is to be holding. And yet people are still getting into it. They're still buying it. You know, I saw the Cisco, I showed you guys the Cisco stock, right? For you guys, if you're holding this to, uh, and a lot of, People, they say, you know, I'm in it for the long term. Well, okay, what is your time frame? <laughs> Are you planning to hold it for uh, 30 years? Because if that's the case, you know, okay, maybe you'll make your money back, right? But uh, I'm going to show you guys in a second. If you really do love this company, uh, there's, there's a better time to buy. Uh, because all of these bubbles, and that's what this is, all of them end in a very uh, similar pattern. And there will be an opportunity for you to buy Tesla if you are still interested in buying this company for the long run. But it takes patience. <laughs> okay, but Tesla, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. And it won't be the last time something like this has happened because humans don't really change that much over generations, right? So there are patterns that we can observe and understand in these kinds of bubbles, right? Now, if you really do love Tesla and you would like to buy it, there is a time to do that, but it's not yet. So we already know about the company and there's a kind of a pattern here, right? If you look on this chart here, you'll notice that I drew kind of a trend line. 
and I drew a trend line kind of for Cisco might look a little bit like that and I drew a trend line for Tesla looked a bit a little bit like that as well right there's a there are patterns right um, and you'll notice that the publics they tend to get <laughs> they get in at the top and the smart money they tend to get in at the bottom right so there's different stages it it's on most people don't know about it at first then it grows almost to a parabolic stage already maybe you might say this period right here where my mouse is could be as much as 100 percent growth but then it sells off you'll notice that if you look at a tesla chart you could even say that the first sell-off could be in march and april of this year during covid there's a bear trap but at the end of that it recovers then it goes fully fully full-blown parabolic right there's media attention there's massive enthusiasm you, you know if you've been on YouTube there's actual full channels uh, full entire channels all of their content is fully dedicated to the company of Tesla so there's enthusiasm for this company um, then it gets to a point where it's just immensely overvalued there's a greed there's a delusion phase and we get to a point where there's something called like a new paradigm and there will be people like saying, well, Tesla is the new thing. It's going to take over the world. It's going to replace all other auto manufacturers. They're a technology company. They're going to create smart cars. They're going to be able to use those to drive everybody around the world. Their market cap doesn't matter because it's a technology company, etc., etc. It's a new paradigm, right? But as all good things, they always come to an end. Eventually, it goes down. It goes into a denial phase. Well, we're going to return to normal in some place, but eventually that breaks down, gets into fear, capitulation, and despair. And being a value investor, I'm very, very aware of these emotions over here. <laughs> but eventually it falls below the mean. Now, I think Tesla is an awesome company. And if you want to buy Tesla, this is where you should be looking to buy it. You you can buy it below its, its mean. You can buy it below its fair value. Uh, I think someday that'll come, but it's, it's not yet. And you, this the whole process, like we saw in Cisco, can take years. And, but uh, ultimately, it will come. Uh, another way to kind of think about this, um, I have been, I'm a value investor. So when I see uh, a, a stock that I consider is cheap, that makes me want to buy it. Uh, if it becomes expensive, then that tells me that I want to sell that stock, right? Um, Tesla has become so expensive uh, and has, I believe, recently been introduced to the S&P 500. It's become so, so disconnected that, uh, and there's been times where I have actually owned ETFs of the uh, S&P 500. Uh, it makes me so horrified that I would not even want to own want to own a uh, ETF of this index. I it it just makes it makes me that nervous that I wouldn't even it would it puts a <laughs> a deprecating factor on the entire index. But in any case, I wanted to show you this. This is a quote from Michael Burry. He is very famous for having shorted the housing market in 2008. And he said this, so, and he tweeted this, uh, at Elon Musk, uh, Musk, yes, I am short Tesla, but some free advice for a good guy. Seriously, issue 25 to 50% of your shares at the current ridiculous price. But that's not dilution. You'd be cementing permanence and untold optionality. If there are buyers, sell that hashtag Tesla souffle. Now, Obviously, Michael, he's got his uh, motivations here. He wants that dilution because it's going to force the stock price down. <laughs> if they dilute it, it's going to make, uh, with almost 100% certainty, the stock price to go down and thus Michael Berry would uh, make money because he short the stock. But in some points of this, um, I think he's right. <laughs> uh, and I get, he, I get his motivation. But if he was to uh, issue equity in his uh, in Tesla for the current, uh, I don't know, like so let's say half the market cap. Let's say he issued th uh, 
$300 billion worth of equity and people are that uh, enthusiastic about Tesla that they wanted to buy it, that would actually probably change some of my uh, opinion on this stock because then the uh, market cap of this company would actually kind of almost halfway make sense <laughs> if this company had, let's say, $300 billion in cash uh, in it, on its balance sheet, then um, it, that would only make the stock at $600 billion currently. I don't know, we could say, and we maybe we'll say that the fair value of it, the company would be $50 billion or $100 billion. It would only make it less than 100% overvalued. So if, if, Mike, Mike, uh, if Elon Musk does what Michael Beery said, it would actually... Um, be insane, but it would actually s kind of cement um, this bubble in from popping. So I don't know. That would be something I'd be watching for. Um, I don't know if he can do it, if he, but if he does, uh, I would consider changing my opinion on this stock. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking, well, what can I learn from all of this? Uh, now, there are some lots of patterns in those bubbles, which I mentioned before. Uh, and if you're aware of them, then it should tell you that if you own an asset, that it's time to get the heck out of that asset. And also that if you're interested in a particular asset, that there's a particular time to buy in it, yeah? Uh, the other thing is that we can kind of learn from human behavior. Now, these kinds of uh, asset bubbles, they've been happening for hundreds of years. Since we've had um, kinds of e commerce, um, it, there's, they've been happening, and human behavior doesn't really change. So if we can learn from these, we can fro profit from them in the future. Now I would like to show you the first recorded uh, asset bubble, and that is called Tulip Mania. The Tulip Mania is considered by many as the first recorded case of a financial bubble. It took place in the 17th century during the Dutch Golden Age. At that time, the Netherlands was one of the world's leading economies, thanks to its rapidly growing international commerce and trading operations. The economic boom led to an increased demand for luxury goods, and tulips were among the most desired, particularly those with unusual colors and patterns. Depending on the variety, the price of a single flower could easily exceed the income of a skilled worker, or even the price of a house. The creation of futures contracts pushed the prices even higher as the flowers didn't have to physically change hands. It's said that the bubonic plague also had an impact on the market because people were more inclined to take investment risks. Following a few months of unreasonable demand, more and more farmers started growing the flowers, but the supply eventually got too high and the tulip market found its peak in February of 1637. There was a sudden lack of buyers, and after a failed tulip auction in Harlem, fear and panic spread very quickly, causing the bubble to burst in less than a week. Many considered the tulip mania as a prime example of a financial bubble, where greediness and hype drove prices far beyond reasonable levels.